program is brought to you by Agnes Scott College. For more information about Agnes Scott College, please visit our website at agnesscott.edu.
Please be seated. Good morning and welcome. This is a most joyful day. The rain has held off. The sky is trying to be blue. But most of all, you have made it to this day. This day for which you have strived in your four years here and the day that marks an incredibly dramatic life change. So please join me as we open this important event with prayer. God of grace and mercy, today is the day that marks a new chapter in this life we have known. No longer will we live down the hall from our dearest friends or encounter them in the middle of Evans or in the library late at night. No longer will we be able to sleep until five minutes before class and still make it on time. No longer will we have to will the printer to feed faster so we can turn in that paper. No longer will we be surrounded by the beauty of Agnes Scott, this college we call home, and be able to take it for granted. We seek, O oh Lord, a world of hope, tolerance, and social justice, where poverty has been overcome and people live in dignity and security. We seek to be partners with others in the world seeking to end poverty, provide safe living environments for those who are the least able to provide themselves. We seek to com a commitment to the uplifting and upholding the dignity of all peoples. We have so many choices to make that we are often overwhelmed. We are stymied by the desire to do what one facet of our culture tells us to do, and we are tested when it is suggested to do otherwise. No matter the name we call you, you call us to serve each other and care for your gift to us, the world. Give us your guidance as we go from this place. Remind us that you are the ultimate guide if only we will take the time to slow down and listen. We pray for these women, our leaders of tomorrow. We live in respect for one another, with peace among the nations, even when that hope seems far distant. We thank you for all your blessings, no matter the name we use to call you, the light, Allah, Shiva, Adonai, Jesus. Help us, Holy One, to be present to those around us, to help those who are in need, and to be a full member of our communities, and to live with respect and grace. In your holy names we pray. Amen. Commencement exercises in this, the 120th year of Agnes Scott College, are now begun. Welcome, families and guests, Agnes Scott trustees and faculty, all who have given so much to nurture and support those who are graduating today. I'd like to thank the Peachtree Brass and Professor Calvert Johnson for providing our beautiful music. It is a bright, beautiful, and dry day here in Presser Quad. Today, we gather to celebrate the achievements and accomplishments of the class of 2009 and to share the joy and pride which they and their families and friends feel at this significant time. And we also celebrate the awarding of Agnes Scott's graduate degree, the Master of Arts in Teaching. And I rejoice with all these graduates. This moment right here today marks the culmination of years of study and the presence of family and friends signifies the support, the love, and belief in you that helped to make this moment possible. So to all, welcome on this very happy occasion. In order to ensure that all can hear and to maintain the dignity of this ceremony, I would ask everyone to please remember to turn off your cell phones, your pagers, your Blackberries, your text messaging, and all other electronic devices. And we also ask that you refrain from taking photographs during the speeches. Thank you. 
following the ceremony families and friends of our graduates are invited to gather with members of the college community on the wood of quadrangle for a reception to celebrate together today all eyes hearts and hopes are upon you two hundred and five students strong who will graduate or receive an advanced degree and we're here to celebrate your remarkable achievements and to applaud your aspirations. The class of 2009 ranges in age from 20 to 44 years old. You hail from 21 states and 11 countries, from Afghanistan to Bulgaria, from Haiti to Nigeria. 55% of you have studied abroad while you've been at Agnes Scott pursuing research service and study in places as far afield as Iceland, Finland, Belgium, Jordan, Bulgaria, China, Chile, the Czech Republic, Ghana, Greece, Switzerland, Argentina, Senegal, New Zealand, Nepal, Guatemala, and Ecuador. And I probably missed a few. We have watched with pride your transformation into strong, feisty Agnes Scott women, true and a few good men. Truly, <laughs> truly embracing Agnes Scott's mission of thinking deeply, living honorably, and engaging the intellectual and social challenges of your time. Indeed, your class embodies the theme of transformation, making the decision to abandon your original mascot, muses or daughters of Apollo, to take up a rather more ironic and edgy moniker, <laughs> the gold diggers. As gold diggers, you have dug deep inside yourselves for gold, working harder than you thought possible, winning accolades as writers, researchers, athletes, digital designers, dancers, public speakers, musicians, and scholars. You put on one of the best junior productions ever. <laughs> You've broken school records from the basketball court to Fulbright scholarships. You've been pioneers in many areas, producing some of Agnes Scott's first dance majors, sustainability interns, Bavir research interns at the Centers for Disease Control, and scholars of the Women's Global Leadership Center. You produced the college's first greenhouse gas emissions inventory and helped take Agnes Scott to number two in the state and number 39 in the country in Recycle Mania. And you headlined the first sports team in Agnes Scott history to make it to the NCAA National Championships. Yesterday, the Scotty tennis team advanced in the first round of the NCAA Division III Championships, beating Grove City College, Pennsylvania, 5-4. to four. And at this very moment, they are in Lexington, Virginia, preparing for the second round match against Emory, which begins at 10 o'clock this morning. Three members of your class, Tara Brinkman, Lindsay Burdett, and Esther Kaplan are missing commencement today to play for Scotty Glory. So let's give them and their teammates a big Scotty cheer. But there's more, so much more to the gold diggers. You've provided exemplary leadership to the multicultural organizations, religious life groups, political and civic organizations, and honor court. You have challenged the college to live honorably, and you have served in your community, working with children, with refugees, with many other organizations. You have done remarkable things behind the scenes, and you have been good sisters and friends to one another. Over the past few weeks, we've been so happy to hear the bell and main hall ring out on Fridays at noon to celebrate seniors who've been accepted to graduate school or received job offers. In this tough economy, it's especially gratifying to know that many of you have had the joy of ringing that bell and signing your names on the wall. For some, it's graduate school, and this year's seniors will be next year's first-year students at many, many prestigious graduate programs, including ones at Emory, Georgetown, Miami University, St. Louis University, Mercer, the University of Wisconsin-Madison, the University of South Carolina, the University of Georgia, and many more. Three of you are headed abroad on Fulbright scholarships, and a goodly number for Teach for America, JET, and other teaching programs. The job and internship offers have been rolling in, too. You're headed off to positions at Coca-Cola, the Jesse Ball DuPont Foundation, Georgia Power, Georgia Tech, the YMCA, New Harmony Theater in Indiana. You'll be working at churches, schools, nonprofits, 
two of you are headed to france to pursue careers in publishing and in what's probably an agnes scott first the perfume industry several of you will be right here at agnes scott helping to run labs the dalton gallery and spearheading our e-portfolio initiative and for those who are still looking and your parents don't forget, there were 4.3 million jobs advertised last month in this country. And employer survey after survey shows that the capabilities and skills most useful to companies and organizations are precisely those that you have learned here at Agnes Scott. The ability to write, to speak, to work in diverse teams, and to think critically and creatively. You are well prepared for these challenging times. Preparing young people to navigate the 21st century world is surely the most important way in which we can invest in the future. America needs great teachers, women and men, to inspire young people to learn, to engage the world in a spirit of rigorous curiosity, and to aspire for greater things. Those of you who are receiving our Master of Arts in Teaching degree today have taken on this immensely important task as students and educators, as apprentice teachers in area classrooms, you have been on a great adventure that draws on every single aspect of your being, your mind, your heart, your strength, your resilience. We are so proud of each and every one of you and wish you well as you pursue the great and noble vocation of teaching. Please send us many, many Agnes Scott students in the future. So, congratulations to the class of 2009 and our MAT graduates. And now it's my great pleasure to introduce our commencement speaker. I've told her that I can't imagine a more appropriate speaker for our college than Dr. Helene Gale. She has helped invigorate the organization with a name that says what it is and does. Dr. Helene Gale, President and CEO of CARE USA, directs one of the world's leading humanitarian organizations. And like Agnes Scott College, her strategy at CARE is built first and foremost around empowering women. Dr. Gale knows that especially in developing nations, men may think they're in charge, but women are the ones who really get things done. Under her direction, CARE has been reinvigorated with a simple strategy. If you really want to get something done right, ask a woman to see to it. Gail guides CARE's vision for a world of hope, tolerance, and social justice, where poverty has been overcome and people live in dignity and security. CARE's more than 60 years of experience working with both local communities and national governments in nearly 70 countries worldwide affirms the strength and power of women to change societies. CARE places a special focus on empowering marginalized women and girls to become forces for long-lasting social change to improve their lives and the well-being of their families, communities, countries, and the world. Before joining CARE in 2006, Dr. Gale was director of HIV, TB, and reproductive health within the Global Health Program at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. An internationally recognized expert on health, development, and humanitarian issues with a lifelong commitment to social justice and equity, she earned her undergraduate degree at a women's liberal arts institution, Barnard College. She earned her medical degree from the University of Pennsylvania and a master's degree in public health from the Johns Hopkins University. A board-certified pediatrician, she directed the National Center for HIV, STD, and TB Prevention at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, and served in the U.S. Public Health Service for 20 years, retiring as a rear admiral. While in medical school, Dr. Gale's career was influenced by an inspiring speech by Dr. D.A. Henderson, who at the time was a director at the World Health Organization and a leader of the worldwide campaign to eradicate smallpox. As Dr. Gale has put it, public health is a marriage between society and medicine. As a practicing doctor, your patient is an individual. As a public health practitioner, your patient is the community, the nation, and the world. She has traveled all over the world, most recently in Tanzania, South Africa, Peru, Afghanistan, India, and Bangladesh, to personally meet and learn from women in the communities where CARE works. No matter how you measure it, she says, women and girls bear the brunt of poverty. 
they are also our greatest hope for eradicating it improving women's lives can be the crucial first step towards creating lasting social change in their communities dr gail's leadership vision courage and let me say it feistiness makes her an ideal scotty an ideal commencement speaker and role model for our graduates. We're honored and delighted she can be with us today to share her reflections with the class of 2009. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Helene Gale. Thank you very much, President Keish, graduates, members of the board of trustees, distinguished faculty, family, friends, and guests. Good morning. I am so pleased to share this day with you. I'm especially proud to be here because as mentioned, as a graduate of a women's liberal arts college myself, I personally understand the value of the unique opportunity you have had here. When I was invited to share my thoughts as today's commencement speaker, my directions were, of course, to be feisty and inspirational and give a feisty and inspirational speech. So I did some research and found out that the mascot for the class of 2009 is Gold Digger from the Kanye West song. Now, Kanye West strikes me as being a pretty feisty guy. So I Googled Gold Digger, thinking maybe I could borrow some of the lyrics from his song. Raise your hand if you're familiar with those lyrics. <laughs> okay, those of you who are familiar with the lyrics know that there is not a single line in that song that is appropriate for a graduation speech. <laughs> those of you who are not familiar with it, you just gotta trust me about that. <laughs> so I decided instead to try for inspirational. So that prompted me to take a trip down memory lane and reflect on how events have unfolded since I sat where you are now ready to take on the world. Okay, don't groan. I know you're probably doing the math. She graduated in 1976. This trip down memory lane could take a while. But let me quickly say that one of the things I learned along the way is that a good commencement speech has a good beginning, a good ending, and the two should be as close together as possible. <laughs> so I promise I'm gonna try to be brief. <laughs> Now, in choosing Agnes Scott, all of you made a commitment to its mission. That mission, as has been said already, is to think deeply, live honorably, and engage the intellectual and social challenges of your time and the world you inherited. What a mission, and one that is as relevant today as ever. Because today, you're graduating into a complicated world, and a world that is full of paradoxes. For example, even with today's economic crisis, there are more millionaires and billionaires than ever before, yet almost half of the world's population, about three billion people, struggle to live on less than $2 a day. We grapple with obesity in this country, while almost a billion people around the world face chronic hunger. A billion people across our planet have no access to safe drinking water, while we can choose from an array of bottled designer waters. I could go on with paradoxes, the world is full of them, but I want to point out that our paradoxes and challenges are also more global in nature than ever before. You are inheriting a world of global challenges. In today's world, what happens in one country ripples out to the rest of the global community. The outbreak of swine flu that's been in the news recently is just a reminder of our increasingly borderless world. And we've seen the extent of our global inter interconnectedness dramatically as economies worldwide reel from the breakdown within our international financial system. But these paradoxes and challenges of the world you inherit also present immense opportunities. An opportunity for courage and creativity. An opportunity to apply what you've learned in your time here. An opportunity to choose what you want to leave, where you want and how you want to leave your mark an opportunity to become forces for change so that you can create the world that you want to live in and leave to the next generation. This is your chance to create a world that is better than the one you inherited. These words are easy to say, create a better world. The question each of us must ask and answer for ourselves is how. 
My quest to answer this question started several decades ago. When I was growing up, social change was in the air you breathed in this country. Civil rights, the women's movement, the anti-war movement, liberation struggles in Africa. I saw the power of collective ash action causing change, and so I grew up knowing that I wanted to be part of something bigger than myself. But at that time, I also saw myself as decidedly anti-establishment. In fact, back in that day, it was easy to adopt the view that changing the world was just about being against something. Racism, sexism, apartheid, Nixon, bras, you name it. I protested it. I was against it. It wasn't until late in college that I began to see how a career in medicine and health could be an amazing path for contributing to social change, and that social change was better achieved by being for something rather than by being against everything. But believe it or not, the path I chose in health was defined at least by a commencement speech. Now, just to let you off the hook, let me point out that it wasn't any of the speeches that were given at my commencement. I admit I have very little recollection of any of these. So I'm totally prepared that this speech today may not be life-changing and that an hour later you may well not even remember it or who gave it. <laughs> In any event, the speech that helped change my life was at my brother's commencement by D.A. Henderson. Dr. Henderson was one of the leaders of the worldwide campaign to eradicate smallpox. Using the tools of public health, he helped lead the effort that took smallpox, a disease that is estimated to have claimed over 500 million lives since the time of the pharaohs, and wiped it off the face of the earth. I was simply awed by the audacity that that effort represented. His speech was an aha moment when my vague notions came into sharp focus. Then and there, I realized that I could use my health career to impact the lives of whole communities and whole populations and hopefully impact broader social change. This led me to pursue a career in public health and landed me at the Centers for Disease Control in the mid-80s, just about the time a new epidemic was beginning to surface. When I arrived at CDC, many people dissuaded me from working on this thing called AIDS because they thought it was just a curiosity and would probably not amount to much. Of course, before long, it was clear that AIDS had become one of the defining public health issues of our time and was also a glaring example of some of the greatest social and economic inequities our world faces, whether gender inequality, racism, homophobia, or poverty. So as such, communities and nations that have slowed the spread of HIV have done so by changing the way that people view and relate to each other. Where rates of HIV have declined, you've seen governments working constructively with marginalized populations, preachers working with prostitutes, straights working alongside gays. So for nearly 30 years, first at the CDC and then at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and now at CARE, I've looked for opportunities to use my medical and public health background as a tool to enable me to band with others to make concrete contributions addressing social injustice. That's why I'm so proud and honored to be at the helm of an organization whose mission is fighting poverty and defending dignity and puts the empowerment of women and girls at the core of that mission. As young women leaders yourself, you know the important role you can play to bring greater equity and balance in a world that is in desperate need of harmony, greater balance, and different models of leadership. As you leave Agnes Scott and prepare to engage a wider world on your own terms, I'd like to offer a few observations on leadership to take you on that journey. Not long ago, I read a report about leadership in the Harvard Business Review. They interviewed 125 leaders of all age who were known for their own effectiveness. They found that there was a range of skills that characterized successful leaders that there was no universal way or right way to be a leader. However, one ingredient was consistently cited as an important trait of leadership. That ingredient was not assertiveness, it wasn't decisiveness, or wasn't team building. The most important capability, they said, is self-awareness, being authentic and true to who you are. Authentic leaders demonstrate a passion for their mission they practice their values consistently, and they lead with their hearts as well as their heads. We are at a time in history when the world is looking for authentic leadership in all parts of the world and in all parts of society. We are also at a time 
when old paradigms of leadership are being reexamined. And women are the key to that. There have been many studies to determine whether and how women leaders are different from men. And though I, I am pretty skeptical about stereotypes and generalizations, I do think there is a truth in at least two fairly consistent findings about women leadership. First, women tend towards a consensus style of leadership, bringing people together and trying to work towards a shared vision. Research has shown that this style is better suited for leading a modern organization and for solving our current day problems than the more authoritarian style that is associated with male leadership. Second, women bring different perspectives to issues and bring different issues to the table. Women approach peace building and tradition, no, traditional notions of power and structure differently. And this adds balance to problem solving. Yet despite the advantages of women serving in leadership roles, we all face formidable obstacles. Research from India offers interesting insight. In 1992, the amendment to the Indian Constitution reserved one third of all local council seats for women. Twelve years later, in 2004, researchers from the Poverty Action Laboratory at MIT conducted surveys to determine what impact this increased representation of women in leadership roles had had. They found that villages headed by women invested more in services that benefited the whole community. They invested in schools, roads, water pumps, and that the quality of those services were actually higher than in the villages that were headed by men. That the politicians were less corrupt. Villagers with female-headed counselors were 25% less likely to report paying bribes for basic services. But here's the kicker. Voters there were less satisfied with the performance of female politician. In opinion polls, women actually got lower approval ratings. The research conducted, uh, concluded that there's still a significant cultural barrier to recognizing women as competent policymakers, even when women do a good job, because bias perception means that they're not recognized for their contributions. Well, I think that's a sobering finding and, and unfortunately consistent with some of the things that we see here in our own country. In corporate America, men still continue to receive higher wages and faster promotions. Another Harvard Business uh, Review article published just a year ago found that of Fortune 500 chairs, presidents, CEOs, and COOs, only 6% were women. In academia, there is some good news. As of 2008, four of the eight Ivy League schools here in the United States are led by women but we know that there's still way, a long way to go, even in academia. So we know there are challenges that remain. To borrow a concept I, I once read, the problem isn't really just a glass ceiling, a single obstacle. It's the many obstacles along the way. The challenge might be more accurately described as navigating a labyrinth. Passage through it requires persistence, awareness, and a careful analysis of the puzzle. But I'm not discouraged about any of this because at the same time I have been privileged to learn from some of the best teachers in the world about the power of women to bring about change. You know, you'll find leaders in all places, in all levels of society. I never could have imagined 30 years ago as a young doctor that I would learn about leadership from some of the most marginalized women in the world. Afghanistan was the first country I visited when I started CARE. When the Taliban came to power, one of the first things they did was to prohibit the teaching of young girls. I visited one of the schools we're helping to fund over there. Under the Taliban, it actually was able to remain open as a, quote, sewing school. But in fact, the teachers risked their lives and freedom to teach girls literature, math, and science. Today, girls in some villages walk two miles and sit in makeshift schools with ambitions of becoming doctors, engineers, political leaders. Some of you may remember in the news earlier this year two sisters in Afghanistan, Atifa and Shamsia. They were walking to school one morning when two men on a motorcycle pulled alongside them. One of the men asked where the girls were going. Shamsia told them they were going to school. The man pulled out a plastic squirt gun, aimed it, and sprayed acid in their faces. Atifa and Shamsia will be disfigured for life, 
and marked by the trauma in many ways. When asked if they would stop attending school, one of the girls told a reporter that they could spray her a hundred more times and she would still go to school. And she said, I will go to school because I want other girls to have the chance of an education. Shamsia told a reporter, why shouldn't I want to go to school? I want our country to persevere. I have to do something for my country. I must go back to school. Together with you, young women like Atifa and Shamsia will be tomorrow's doctors, lawyers, teachers, and scientists. You and they will start businesses, run for office. Together, you and they will become forces for change in the world. Together, you and they will create that better world. I started by saying you are inheriting a world of paradoxes and global challenges. Your time has prepared you to turn what you found and make those challenges opportunities. The challenges are daunting, but they are also not insurmountable. Remember, you became part of the solution to creating the world you seek when you started here at Agnes Scott. And as the chapter closes, the long years you've labored, striving for marks, have prepared you to leave as part of the solution to creating the world you seek. One of the most remarkable people I have had the privilege of meeting is Nelson Mandela. So in closing, let me use a quote he used in his inaugural speech as South Africa's president. He said, our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. As Nelson Mandela was enduring those long years of incarceration, he never lost his faith that he could help change the world. That same spirit was found in the townships of Soweto in South Africa, among the poor women who struggled against so many forms of adversity, but sang a song over and over with this verse, we're the ones we've been waiting for, reminding themselves that they too had an important role to play in the future of their society. So those two thoughts contain everything that I want to say to you today. The challenges the world present to you are great, but so are you. This is the moment you've been waiting for. And as the world waits for people of talent and vision to bridge the yawning chasm between what appears inconceivable and what we hope to make inevitable, realize that you're the ones you've been waiting for. You are the members of the Black Ring Mafia. You are powerful beyond measure. The world awaits your spark. This is your moment. Congratulations. And uh, for your own authentic leadership for a better world. That was wonderful. A few weeks ago, we celebrated the stellar achievements of many members of the class of 2009 at our awards convocation. And I just want to call your attention in your program, in your commencement program, to the list of these uh, prizes that members of the class of 2009 won, as well as those who, have, uh, who were inducted into Phi Beta Kappa and who's who among students in American universities and colleges. And please join me in applauding these student achievements. And now it's my great pleasure to recognize some uh, special achievements uh, among our faculty. You know, the faculty are the heart and soul of Agnes Scott College, and they bring such love and dedication and talent uh, to their work every day. And I, my first, uh, the first award I'll, I have the pleasure of presenting is the Vulcan Materials Company Teaching Excellence Award. It was created to recognize faculty who make a significant difference in both the classroom and the campus community. This award, which carries a $1,000 stipend, is endowed by Vulcan Materials and managed by the Georgia Foundation for Independent Colleges. Each year, Agnes Scott professors are invited to submit nominees for this award, and a committee comprised of faculty, students, an alumna, and a staff member select the recipient for her or his ability to motivate and inspire students. So that selection process makes the Vulcan Award especially meaningful. 
She's the most energetic, encouraging, and passionate person I know, said one nominator for this year's award winner. She helped me develop confidence in myself and foster my artistic voice. I've seen her help others develop their sense of self in every course I've taken with her, said another nominator. Her courses are innovative and constantly changing because she encourages students to participate in shaping the class. She teaches by doing, and maybe more importantly, by creating a space and an atmosphere in which other people can develop their own talents. This is what liberal arts education is supposed to do. Please join me in congratulating our 2009-2010 Vulcan Award winner, Associate Professor of Art, Nell Ruby. Now, unfortunately, Professor Ruby is on a well-earned sabbatical this semester and could not attend today's commencement ceremony, but I'm sure she heard that great round of applause. I'd like to ask all previous winners of the Vulcan Teaching Award to stand so we may recognize you. While the Vulcan Award acknowledges <clears throat> what a faculty member does for his or her students, the Joseph R. Gladden Jr. Public Lecture Award is given every year to a member of the Agnes Scott faculty whose scholarly activities are especially noteworthy. It honors Joe Gladden, who served as chair of the Agnes Scott Board of Trustees for 10 years, stepping down in 2002. Award recipients are asked to give a public lecture to the entire community on a topic related to their scholarly work. A $1,000 stipend and release from teaching one course during the semester in which the lecturer is scheduled assist the lecturer in creating the presentation. We select the Gladden Public Lecture Award winner a year in advance. For the 2010-2011 award, we had so many deserving candidates that the committee struggled hard to decide but one faculty member ultimately rose above the rest. A prolific scholar, a wonderful teacher and campus citizen, and a public intellectual. She looks way too young to have published as much as she has. She's published over 40 articles and book chapters addressing questions we all want to know the answers to. For example, does television rot your mind? <laughs> Do immigrants work in riskier jobs? What is the impact of welfare reform on marriage and divorce? She has brought her skills as an economist to bear on some of the most important intellectual and social challenges of our time. I'm delighted to announce the recipient of the Gladden Public Lecture Award for 2010-2011 is Madeline Zavodny, Associate Professor of Economics. Professor Zavodny is presenting at a conference, so <laughs> not surprisingly. Next year, our previously announced uh, Gladden lecturer, uh, Gladden lecture will be presented by Professor Larry Riddle of the Mathematics Department, and I'd like to ask Professor Riddle and all previous recipients of the Gladden Award to stand so we may recognize you. And now it's my great pleasure to make two special announcements. We are inaugurating a new three-year rotating endowed chair, the Charles Loredans Professorship, which will be held by associate or full professors who exemplify the Agnes Scott ideal of a scholar teacher. Our first recipient combines wonderfully accessible cutting edge scholarship on our American music heritage with an infectious spirit of joy in her teaching and service. Please join me in congratulating our first Charles Loredans professor, Tr Tracy Laird of the music department. And our final faculty honoree has had an extraordinary life journey. 
Her eloquence in sharing that journey, her passionate commitment to nurturing excellence in young women of all backgrounds, make her an extraordinary scholar, teacher, and mentor, and her presence in our community a very special gift. And so I'm delighted to announce a multi-year appointment as the Aisha Carden Distinguished Professor of Psychology and Director of the GEMS Program, Professor Larita Coleman Brown. She didn't know that was coming. <laughs> Last year, under Professor Coleman Brown's leadership, we began piloting a wonderful new program called GEMS, Generating Excellence in Math and Science. And the testimonials from students in that pilot project shows that we are already transforming lives by encouraging young women to pursue research and science careers. So we're excited to see what will happen in the years to come. You've heard her speak, you know what a special leader she is. This morning we're honored to have with us a woman who has distinguished herself as a scientist, a humanitarian, and a social activist. It is our privilege this morning to present Dr. Helene Gale with Agnes Scott's Doctor of Science degree, Honoris Causa. And so I'm, it's my pleasure to present our honored guest to Harriet King, class of 1964, and chair of the Agnes Scott College Board of Trustees. Madam Chair, I have the honor to present to you Dr. Helene Gale to receive the degree of Doctor of Science. Thank you. Some of us need a script. <laughs> Helene Gale, scientist, humanitarian, and social activist, an internationally recognized expert. A pediatrician and epidemiologist, you have published in numerous scientific journals while spearheading efforts to eradicate, to educate the public on HIV AIDS, STD, and TB prevention, exemplifying the very best in public health leadership. A role model for women, you have devoted your career to tackling issues that disproportionately affect women and girls. You put your knowledge to work in a passionate pursuit of social justice and equity. An advocate for the rights of women and girls, you have improved the lives of women and girls around the world by addressing malnutrition in children, reducing domestic violence, implementing child survival programs in Africa, and HIV AIDS prevention programs in India, and developing strategies to improve access to reproductive health. You help all of us connect the dots, promoting the empowerment of girls and women as the key to global development for all. A visionary leader, you foresee an free of poverty and disease, and work tirelessly toward making this dream a reality. A woman of firsts, you were the CDC's first director of the National Center for HIV, STD, and TB Prevention, and the first woman, the first person of color, and the first physician to lead CARE, the world's premier humanitarian organization. An advocate for change, you make decisions based on facts, you don't shy from controversy, you never hesitate to push the envelope, you promote the unconventional approach. In sum, you are feisty. <laughs> you embody the mission of Agnes Scott College by thinking deeply, living honorably, and engaging the intellectual and social challenges of our times. Therefore, Agnes Scott College is privileged to convey upon you Helene D. Gale, the doc degree of Doctor of Science, Honoris Causa.